In the mid-2000s, a crap riding unit was sentenced to a life of employment for a crime they didn't commit. In 2014, they both escaped this minimum security stockade to the adventuring underground. Today, still hunted by BMW riders everywhere, they survive as riders of fortune. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and you don't mind waiting a really long time for them to get there, maybe you should hire the C-Team. Faster, slower. <laughs> so at the end of the last video, the huge flat expanse of the prairies was about to draw to a close, and we were about to leave Oklahoma, skirt through New Mexico, and enter the mountains in Colorado. However, before leaving the flatlands, as we were so close to Texas, there was another thing I had to cross off the bucket list. Excuse me, is this the way to Amarillo? Is this the way to Amarillo? And it turns out that song didn't do very well in the USA, so people actually just give you directions to Amarillo. So this is the way to Amarillo, this is the correct way. Cool, right, perfect, thank you very much. So, now that's out of the way. As we entered New Mexico, the terrain turned from flatlands into rolling hills, and the trails were starting to undulate and become more exciting. It wasn't long before we left New Mexico, entered Colorado, and were now riding through the valleys and taking in the new sights, which actually included real cowboys lassoing real cows. We watched from a distance, but it wasn't long before we got invited over for a chat. I was only just inquiring what was going on, because we're English, so we've never seen anything like this before. Oh yeah. Very impressive though, to actually see somebody actually throw a lasso. And once again we got dragged off of the trail and shown some more American hospitality. Thank you very much Rob. Thanks Rob. Thanks for giving us a beer and then disappearing off again and just leaving us at your house with a beer. Suits <laughs> us. With the beers finished and no guests to thank, we headed out again to do our first hill climb in thousands of miles. It was nice to have some different terrain to battle and our poor suspension was once again being pushed to its limits but we made it to the top. However, as we reached the top, something else was reaching its peak. My frustrations. You see, I'd been lying to myself, and in a way, I've also been lying to you guys too. Things were not all hunky-dory like this series has made out, and I was having real problems travelling for this long with someone else. As can be seen here, where for some reason my tripod was snagged on something in my front basket and wouldn't sit right, so I threw a little tantrum and tore it out and scattered all of my stuff all over the trail. I was growing more and more unhappy each day, and I was turning into a bit of a dick. What's that all about? It's like a child throwing their toys out of their crowd. I tried many times to explain my feelings on camera, and had failed. Well... But, as around this time I'd finally come clean to Rachel, it's time to tell you guys too. Please bear with me, I need two minutes of your time, but it needs to be said. Basically, I was getting bored. How can I be bored on a trip like this? Well. The biggest factor was caused by how we both appreciated landscapes. I only get my hit from them when I'm moving and there's a constant stream of ever-changing wonderment to see. It's like I need an assault on my senses to feel content, trying to summon as much brain power as physically possible to try and store all that I'm experiencing, trying to pay attention to the trail and not crash, while also desperately trying to look up and take in my surroundings. This is how my best memories are formed, and if I'm stationary, it's too slow and I'm bored. Rachel, on the other hand, can only truly appreciate scenery if she's stationary and is able to stop, relax and soak it in in as much time as she needs. Also, Rach gets far more from nature's beauty than I do. Sometimes I'm jealous of how content she can be, sat down and absorbing what this planet can offer. It's not that I can process it faster, she actually processes more. 
And I reckon it's the engineer in me that only scratches the surface, whereas Rachel's soul actually absorbs it, and as such, needs more time. So for me, every time we entered one of these gorgeous valleys and I was starting to absorb it, I could just about deal with having to check my mirror every 10 seconds to make sure that she's still there. But if Rach stopped for a photograph, to absorb a view, or even just to fill up with fuel, it would break me out of my zone and I would be bored and frustrated that my chance to really enjoy this moment had gone. And I couldn't ride ahead because it would just mean waiting for her to catch up somewhere else. Or if she took a long time, me riding back to see if she needed help. And there are other factors at play too, but the stopping for scenery is the easiest one to explain for you guys. Basically, when you travel with someone, you have to compromise. Neither of you will have the exact trip you want, and that's fine for a while, or for some people. But for me, I was having a hard time balancing the good and the bad. And there had been loads of good times. If it was all crap, I'd have bailed months ago. Everything has good and bad points. Like camping. Sometimes it's lovely, and sometimes you get woken up at 3 in the morning by a flash flood running through your tent. In the morning we surveyed the damage, and while it looked disgusting, the tent had actually kept the mud and water outside of the sleeping area. However, Dave the spider that you might remember from Canada really hadn't fared well. But worse than that, it had been in the USA so long that all the high fructose corn syrup in American food had given him type 2 diabetes, so I was forced to amputate his legs and mount him on my top box. He did get a cowboy hat and boots though, so every cloud and all that. So it certainly wasn't all bad. And there were more good times ahead, because there was a challenge ahead. We were about to hit the mountain passes. They would be steep and dangerous, with altitudes so high that our engines would lose almost all power. And any info we found told us not to ride them, which is not what you tell British people. You tell us something's a stupid idea, and you might as well hold a gun to our head. And this sign decided it. You say it's a highway to hell? Bring it on. So the mountain passes and ever-changing and spectacular scenery had indeed changed things up a lot, but some things were still regular programming. So once I pulled the bike up that was pinning Rach to the post, Thank you. we continued our ride. And Rach continued to crash. 
Now, I must state that a rear brake was playing up and would either lock up or would barely work at all. So, all credit to her, because this terrain was very steep and very slippery. <laughs> I didn't know a way to go, so I thought I'd just lay down and wait for you. And I know the camera doesn't show it, but trust me, this was steep. And with Rachel's bike playing up, more crashing was inevitable. I think it's psychological as well, because I know I haven't got brakes. Kind of makes it worse. However, with this crash being just 10 metres from the last, her confidence going was also inevitable. I've just lost my composure to ride. But I just... I bend it again up there because as soon as I touch it, even lightly, the rear brake. Now we've tightened it. I crushed my finger. Seeing Rach like this, I didn't hesitate to fix her bike when she asked me to, and she came up with a really ingenious idea. Swap the front and rear brake shoes around. The brake shoes over or something. Thus giving them a different biting point. Clever girl, it worked. We rode down the final section of the mountain pass and made it to a campsite near a town, safe and sound. Well, we did. Right, well after uh, one of Rachel's crashes, uh, we're not sure which one, but, uh, so um, Rachel's fared very well, her bike has fared very well. Rachel's just discovered the uh, pots and pans though, do you have, have anything to, to say about the condition of the... Um. <laughs> It's much, uh, it's much, it's much better for pouring now, though. Oh yeah! Oh wow! Oh, you've actually, yeah, you've invented an easy pour saucepan. Yeah, um, which I always thought would come in handy. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it's not all bad. It's great for pasta. Oh yeah, yeah. Brilliant for pasta. Very good. <clears throat> like as a pirate's hat as well, I reckon. Ah! Well, you said that's not our dad's army. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, buggered. <laughs> we rode into town to get some breakfast, and when we returned to our bikes, we received some stealth American hospitality. Okay. You've got a present. <laughs> What's to the free spirit? <laughs> it's not much, but I'd love to live by care and free. Oh, that's really sweet. <laughs> Quite the van. Thank you very much, van. Van. Wherever you are. <laughs> That's very sweet. <laughs> Where did she go? We never found out. She just vanished. And we had to as well. We decided to summit the famous Pike's Peak and decided to try and coax a single wave from a Harley rider. It was virtually impossible though. They only wave to other Harley riders. But that makes sense because their journeys are just so much cooler than ours. <laughs> Another cool thing was the bicycle speedo that I fitted in Quebec clicked over 10,000 miles just short of the summit, which was cause for a celebration. But it was too cold for a high five. The ride back down gave the best views, and of course, because of our low power, it was much faster than going up. But while we were enjoying the smooth surface, it was soon time to hit the trail once again and finish these mountain passes. And while they were the last passes, they certainly weren't the least dramatic. The sheer scale of them was massive. And I was pushing the limits of my skill by riding back to Rach one-handed with a very expensive DSLR in the other. Gets the pulse racing though. I was trying things like this as a way to average out having to stop for her to take photos. It was helping a bit, but I was still basically unable to deal with having to turn around multiple times per day to see where she was. But she's just so cool. How could I leave her? I mean, just look at this scene. That is one seriously cool chip. I was convinced if I walked away from riding with her, I'd never forgive myself, and most men would never forgive me either. But things felt like they were changing between us. And very soon the terrain changed too. The rocks turned red and we wanted to learn why, so we visited a museum to find out more, which once again gave Rach a chance to shine. This is the Geo Trekker, a wonder of space and time travel technology. Yeah. Ready to go for a ride? Hold on. <laughs> now, to begin the story of the Red Box, you have to go back about a billion years. So here we go. Hold tight, you're going to be moving pretty fast. <laughs> See if we can get you guys a better view. Crust about five miles down, a little over a billion years ago. 
The terrain seemed like it was having a hard time making up its mind too, with the odd tree-filled valley appearing and a stream that caused my engine to cut out and my feet to get wet. Yeah, I really should have learnt to wear them by now. But Rachel was learning how to ride off road. Well, the theory anyway. Stay committed. As I said, she had the theory down. I stayed committed though, didn't I? <laughs> How this woman stays so upbeat about crashing was still continuing to impress me, as was the topography and the occasional stretch of lovely tarmac. Winding through these twisty sections was a dream, and the red rocks had returned, and we're here to stay. And during the next off-road section, we would cross over and enter Utah. The problem was, I was on borrowed time. As the off-roading got trickier, the temperature hotter and the progress slower, I was approaching breaking point. Rach and I had a few teary-eyed talks and tried to iron things out, but with every mile I rode, things inside seemed to be getting darker and darker. I tried, I really did. But one day, as I tried to get up this tricky slope, I finally snapped. Properly. Whoa! So yeah, I'd snapped, and this was the turning point. Rach and I had a big talk, and decided that we would need to travel separately. As I've said before, it's really complicated and I don't expect everyone to understand. Even couples that have been married for 20 years don't spend this long together 24-7 for 18 months, and especially not in the tough conditions of this trip. Both of us wanted our alone time and to ride the way we want to ride, but I was the most frustrated at the compromises, which had turned me into a bit of a dick and Rach wasn't enjoy riding with me anymore. By this point, I wasn't the man that she started the trip with. In the end it was a mutual decision from both of us, that for the sake of our relationship we would ride solo and meet up every three months or so on the way down to Argentina. But there was a problem, we only had one tent, one set of tools and a thing called Nevada coming up, and that was the most desolate and remote section of the whole tat. Our relationship was also an all time low point, so going our separate ways now felt like it might be pretty toxic. We were also determined little bastards, so we made a pact. We would ride the last bit of the tat together, and then at Oregon we would go solo. If I stopped being a dick, we could probably do it. I would try my best to ignore the fact that by this point Rachel had taken 14,500 photographs, and instead focus on the good points of riding with her. As you hit it, hold on the power, and it means you won't bottom out, because you'll wheelie up it. <laughs> that was impressive. <laughs> you actually left the shot. I didn't expect you to go that high. <laughs> it wasn't just me that Rachel's off roading was entertaining. I always crash. And once again, some of these crashes I only found out about while looking through Rachel's GoPro footage to make this video. But in fairness, she always took it much steadier when the situation was dangerous. You do not want to blip the throttle and go off of that edge. I should also say that you shouldn't ride and film along this cliff edge one-handed, but then riding this close to certain death does get the heart racing. Anyway, we rode to the town of Moab to prepare our bikes and supplies for the remoteness of Nevada, but in the morning, disaster struck. Fate, it seems, is not without a sense of irony, and fuck me did it think up a good one for us. During one of Rachel's crashes, as she picked up her bike in soft sand, the sand shifted and she tweaked her back. The following morning it was revealed that she'd slipped a disc and could barely walk. 
It was an old injury that she'd managed for over seven years, but unfortunately when it comes to disc injuries, you can only do your best to manage it and one wrong move can make it reoccur. Even sneezing can slip a disc when you already have the injury. However, we'd made our pact and we were going to finish the tat together. Rach booked herself appointments with chiropractors and we were also given a lovely place to stay for free by Rick, complete with hot tub to help Rachel's back. Now her back was going to take time to heal and as we've seen, I don't do waiting around very well. So I went playing. I found a lovely trail called Slick Rock and proceeded to see what the limits of my C90 were. How the fuck do I get up there? Right, little 90. <laughs> This slick rock trail was brilliant. You just followed the white line along this superbly grippy sandstone and got to gaze out at the beautiful rock formations as you did it. This was a really good place for me to blow off some steam. Some of the slopes were so steep that if I sat down the bike would flip over backwards. And with my tiny suspension, some sections required real precision. But sometimes, you can't be bothered with precision, and you just give it the beans. I was having a great time, and so were my fan club. Just don't ask. Dave the Spider, however, had definitely had smoother rides. And his cowboy hat fell off. But, luckily, a walker found it and then saw Dave's cowboy boots and made the connection. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. That's <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, I came back here day after day to have fun and to test and improve my skills while we waited for Rachel's back to get better. My sand riding was now about as good as you can get on a bike with thin tyres and no power. It's all about keeping it full throttle and being in complete harmony with the balance of it. But there's only so much sand you can ride before you start to get a bit bored again. I'd reached the limit of what you can do on a Honda 90, and Rachel still wasn't better. So I did what any sensible guy does. I bought a beautiful 1973 Honda TL 125 trials bike for 475 bucks and went playing in the middle of nowhere. I'm not going to lie, the suspension travel was lovely. As I blasted through these deserted trails for hours on end, I was once again finding peace with myself. Trail riding soon turned to trials riding though, with me pushing myself to find my limits. And while the camera never makes stuff look steep, hopefully me climbing up this shows the kind of stuff I was doing. The search to get my heart racing was certainly going well. This cliffside trail certainly did. One wrong move and it's a 400 foot drop to your death. Like if you get this angled ledge slightly wrong and it sends you left, you're going down there and you ain't ever coming back. Awesome. So I just carried on riding around, finding things to ride up. And then just generally pratting around. It was a shame that Rach couldn't see this, because as we all know gentlemen, the way to a woman's heart is through wheelies. Although, there were some things that didn't go quite to plan. <laughs> Cut. Yeah. Now the bike was fine, but Rachel on the other hand, was not. It had been two weeks since her injury, and while she could now walk, she couldn't ride a motorcycle across Nevada. There would be sand and mud for hundreds of miles, and they would be hundreds of miles from help. If she lost the front end just once and put her foot down and twisted her back, we would be in serious trouble. And even if I could keep myself entertained here for maybe months until she got better, it would be pointless because winter was nearly here and the passes were about to get closed by snow. Now this is where fate really was having a laugh. I was presented with finishing the tap solo on a plate. Rach didn't want to finish the USA on road, so she'd have to fly home and come back next summer, leaving me to ride the rest of the trail alone. But while I wanted to ride solo, if it was at the expense of Rach, it just wouldn't feel right. It was pretty ironic that the reason we were going to ride apart after Oregon was because of who I am as a person. 
the irony being, because of who I am, I also knew a solution that meant we could ride together for this last bit. I'm not going to lie, as I told Rach my plan, part of me was screaming to just shut up and let her fly home, but a bigger part of me was saying that Rachel's happiness meant more to me than mine. And I guess that's what love is. We don't know what the future holds, but sometimes you just got to step up to the plate and give it everything you've got. I was happy doing this for Rach, she deserved it. And the next piece of footage is 100% genuine. Ladies and gentlemen, we've had a bit of a development during one of Rachel's uh, many crashes, uh, which she's normally fine with. All was going well. The trouble was, uh, as she picked the bike up in some very soft sand, she ended up uh, doing her back in, um, and it's quite a long-standing injury, and basically means that uh, she can't really ride the bike on soft sand anymore, and we've got to go across Nevada. This does lead to basically a problem of she can't really ride the tat on a motorcycle anymore, um, which would mean flying home. Uh, and means that she can't complete it. Uh, I, however, uh, was not willing to let this happen, and uh, I've, I've been a busy little bastard, and I have created something that I think might somehow be more fun than a Honda 90, and what you're about to see now is the first time that Rachel gets to see this. I'm pretty pleased with what I've done, and it means that Rach gets to complete the tat. So, right, I'll face the camera at her. I'm really nervous. <laughs> okay. Three, two, one. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Look at the fucking tires. <laughs> I sit on it. Yeah. <laughs> you shall go to the ball. <laughs> Thank you. This is amazing. It is like a three-year-old designed it. <laughs> Do you want me to fire it up for you? Yeah. Let's take it for a spin. So Rach could now ride her bike without putting a foot down. But what had I actually done? Well, you see, I found a guy called Tucker that owned a scrapyard who also appreciated chivalry. I told him what I wanted to do, and he let me use the vehicles in his yard to achieve it. My tools were very limited, consisting of a MIG welder with no gas, angle grinders and an imperial drill set, but I set to work making it up as I went along, doing the best job possible. In the end, I took the luggage rack off a Honda Quad, the plastics off a Suzuki Quad, the wheels off a Polaris Quad, the front part of a Yamaha bike swing arm, the rear part of a Kazuma motorised shopping cart swing arm, don't ask, kept Rachel's life fan engine, and used other parts off about 4,000 other vehicles, and made the Hondukis Yamaha Zufan 4000. You'll have noticed that it now features swanky purple mudguards to keep the mud at bay, and a luggage rack for Rachel's panniers. I also added some leg protection, because during Rachel's first ride of the Hondukis, it didn't go well. Don't put your feet down! <laughs> yes, never put your foot down on a trike. Within 30 seconds, Rachel's managed to run herself over. Anyway, I'd done my job, the vehicle was made, and if I'm honest, I'm pretty damn proud of it considering what I had to work with. We were now able to ride together again, and finish the tat together. But first I had to teach Rach how to ride a trike, because they ain't easy. We found an enduro track on the outskirts of town, and the lessons began. Right, well, it's time for Rachel to learn how to ride a trike. Uh, there have been some modifications uh, which I've made to the trike. Among some of the safety features, there are bars, which mean that if you put a foot down, then you can't run over your own leg, and they're angled enough that they actually sweep your leg out of the way. But riding a trike is a very, very weird thing. They're they're, they're within reason horrible, but that's kind of why people like them. You never told me it was horrible when you <laughs> said you were going to make it off the trike. I said it was interesting. <laughs> and oh, they yeah. are, yeah. Like someone's new haircut is interesting. Yes, yeah. The handling is very interesting, but also very fun. Like hovercrafts, they're within reason horrific, but the reason I've got one is because they're brilliant. Um, and um, Rachel will uh, learn to ride. I'll do a couple of little sort of practice things, I think. So, um,. Yeah, watch this space as Rach learns to ride a trike. How are you feeling? Terrified, nervous and excited all at the same time. 
So as mentioned before, I went first to show Rach what this trike was capable of. I figured if I rode it to its limit, then Rach could be confident if she took it steady, she'd be fine. That looks horrific to me. You might get one if I hate it. <laughs> it's more fun than the standard 90. Yeah. Feels natural is what you need to learn. And with the reins handed over to Rach, it was time for her to have a go. onto sideways camber with speed. It's lucky I've got this pole told camera because my hands are shaking. being like your mother. Rach didn't try these bits as the learning curve was as steep as they were, so we decided that if a trail section was like this, I'd ride them for her. That way if it went wrong, I'd be the one dealing with it and not her. Plus, if I'm honest, I wanted to do the tricky stuff anyway. I wish I'd built two of these trikes. This thing was awesome. So the lessons were over and Rach had learned how to ride a trike, so we hit the trail. And this is actually the first corner on the trail. <laughs> Why is <he> that? <laughs> you that? Would you like me to pull you out? Well, well I've, I've pulled you out of the tree, so uh, let's go to Oregon. Yay! <laughs> I think the learning's going well, don't yeah. you? Don't worry, Mum, it will be fine. What's the worst that What's can happen? What's the worst that can happen? What is the worst that can happen? Well, we stuck to a deserted cycle path out of town to avoid the cops. Because it's not a 20 grand Harley or Goldwing conversion, we reckon there'd be dicks about it. And the weather wasn't going to be too friendly either, because it wasn't summer anymore. What's that coming over the hill? Is it a pumpkin? Is it a pumpkin? <laughs> Again. <laughs> so yeah, it was now October, which meant there was going to be snow and the final 2,000 miles of the tat were going to be even harder. And considering that one of us was on a vehicle made of scrap that didn't exist a week ago, the odds were stacked against us as we crossed Utah. The open plains were still okay, but as we entered the hills there were definite signs that the weather was hanging on a knife edge. For the moment the layers of snow were thin though, so it wasn't too bad, but after 300 miles the trike gave us something much bigger to worry about. Yeah, um, the Hondukas Yamaka Zufan 4000 has developed uh, interesting handling characteristics. It, um, it's a little bit wobbly from side to side. Upon further investigation, we've discovered that it's not actually any of the welds that have snapped. It's the Yamaha swing arm has actually snapped in half. Yeah, it looks like the, the little miniature Yamaha doesn't like the amount of torsion going through it. So, um, yeah, we are in the middle of nowhere. Like... <laughs> Like no one comes here. <laughs> like no one. Um, we're gonna have to gonna have to work something out. So I'll have a think after I've had my emergency nut butter. <laughs> it's not what you think. <laughs> <laughs> That's peanut butter. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll have a think, and um, sure the next time I turn this camera on, we'll have worked something out or died. I'm pleased to report we didn't die. 
A rancher called Justus keeps cows in these woods and found us by the roadside. He then drove for two hours to his home and back and rescued us with his flatbed trailer. He then took us back to his ranch and supplied us all the tools and help needed to repair the trike. In the end, I just went balls deep and welded a kilo of 6mm plate to the Yamaha swing arm to make it indestructible. Thank you so much, Justus, and I really mean that. Once again, we left American hospitality and headed out. We did the final 250 miles of Utah with the trike now performing flawlessly. It was now a daily lottery as to what the riding surface was going to be. Some sections were dirt and some were snow, but it didn't really matter to Rach because the slippery stuff was now much easier thanks to the Hondukas. If I had my eyes closed on that, I wouldn't have known it was snow. <laughs> this is brilliant! We dropped down from the hills and entered Nevada, which we were pretty happy about. So uh, Ed's quite cold and we've come into Family Dollar um, to find something to warm him up. And he's uh, found this little number. <laughs> Scare off the bears as well. <laughs> <laughs> They've got a really deep uh, crossing. <laughs> Ed has decided to put some wood down and just evil can evil it. We'll see what happens. Bridge is gone. What's the worst that's going to happen? <laughs> a very wet leopard. Oh, a death leopard. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Just do it. Commit. Yay! <laughs> Easy. That went much better than I thought it would. Nevada was proving to be very remote indeed. The valleys were mostly filled with just dirt, brush and really unwieldy barbed wire fence sections that we had to keep opening. We lost count of the amount of times we opened them over hundreds of miles of desolation. The delays they caused were starting to get a little annoying. Dear Americans, please invent the gate. It's an amazing thing, it's brilliant. But I guess it's just part of being in the middle of nowhere on a trail that no one uses. Although one thing I did like was seeing my first tumbleweed I was hoping it would move through this scenic shot by itself, but it didn't. So Rach tried blowing it to help it along. Uh, that came out wrong. But that didn't work, so she gave it a gentle tap. <laughs> well, yeah, you kicked it through the entire shot. Right, well enough of this riveting footage just so I can cross seeing a tumbleweed off my bucket list. Yay! <laughs> One thing that wasn't on the list was when we stopped following Sam's official tat route and followed GPS Kevin's route. We quickly realised why Kevin's route is free. The problem we've got is that uh, our route doesn't take account of how much the American government is willing to sell its public lands for money. Um, this is a mining corporation in this case. So we've ended up inside the do not enter side. side. Um, so yeah, we need to work something out. <laughs> 
to. Looking at the hinges, they haven't welded them on, so I can always work something out. I'm not going to say what I did, but there's no trace of it. We sensibly went back to Sam's route and carried on riding. Well, except for the odd stop. I don't know what happened, but I think I... I did use the brakes this time. We carried on riding again, except for the odd... Well, you can guess. <laughs> the good news is I didn't actually hurt myself, because if it happened so slowly, I stepped off of it. <laughs> Better pick it up, I guess. Please. They were only very slow tumbles, so nothing to worry about. And when the trail turned to mud, it was actually me that was having the problems. While Rachel's trike glided effortlessly over the top... It's a bit easier for you. No, I didn't even realise it was muddy. For me it was a world of pain. This stuff was horrible. For days and days of riding I never managed to go in a straight line. Progress was getting slower and slower for me, whereas Rach could just ride on past. The mud was truly horrendous. And it wasn't just that it made the bike slide around, it would stick together and jam up everything. If it was dry, you could remove it in slabs, but if it was wet, it was nearly impossible. Eventually, it would lock both wheels solid so they wouldn't even turn. The only answer was to remove as much of it as possible and push the bike until the surface was less sticky and keep repeating this until the trail got better. We were once again being tested, but it didn't really matter now. We'd just come too far to be beaten. The weather and terrain was going to try and stop us, but I'd drag these vehicles to Oregon if I had to. We were going to finish this. Operation give it the beans to get up the hill covered in snow off road in the middle of nowhere. Didn't quite work. Whereas Rachel just pisses it. <laughs> Better keep on going I suppose. We'll get to the Pacific eventually. I've been busy squashing down on the snow so we can get the trike through. It's fast and deep. Yeah, you can't really see a lot, but it's snowing, it's night time, we're doing a mountain pass, it's winter, and I can hear Rachel shivering over the intercom. So, uh, yeah, basically, uh, the rule book of what not to do, and uh, we're doing it. So, um, <laughs> better, better carry on. With, uh, following the iPhone, leading us to safety. So how cold are you? Really cold. Legs are red. <laughs> and you're warm, you bastard. Next up. Axe. Thunder. From the cold. So, what temperature do you think it is? Oh no. I hope it's minus 10, and that's why I feel like I do. But I bet it's only like minus 1. It's plus 1. Fuck off. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. What's wrong with me? Plus one. Just.
In the morning we waited until the snow melted before leaving our hotel room for the final push. We were now in Oregon, but the whole state went in a flash. First we were riding through snow-filled forests, and then we dropped down to the coast, and all the snow melted. Our last miles together weren't very exciting, but then that was kind of a good thing. The lack of distractions gave me a chance to look back on what Rachel and I had been through together. 18 months, 25,000 miles with the woman I love. It didn't work out, and there were bad times, but for the memories I have, it was worth it. Ladies and gentlemen, what you are about to witness is quite the climax. It's taken four months, uh, it's taken many miles and rain sails, <laughs> but Rachel and I have finally made it to the sea. Which means, which means we are at the end of the tap, and if we go down this little bumpy section, we are at the end, we've run out of road. Um, Rach, as normal, is uh, not here and she's back there. <laughs> so, um, that's quite fitting really. Uh, yeah, so I'm waiting for Rachel. Don't know where she's gone. Right, well, I'm gonna have to start my bike again and go and find her. Go into gear. Oh, cut out. Just want to finish. I love of... a. Yeah. I'll all be over soon. Oh, Rach is in the ditch. Okay. <laughs> I'll do the last bit. Sorry? So I'll do the last bit. <laughs> Can I be well? Yeah, I'll do. Time for me to go and uh, complete the tat. <sighs> Nearly there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you made it! <laughs> <laughs> Well done, Hondu Kiss Yamakazoo fan 4000. Done me proud. Well done, Ed. <laughs> done my head in. <laughs> I'm joking. You've done me proud. And there we are. The end of the tap and the end of Rachel and I travelling together. From here on out, we would travel solo and meet up about every three months or so. 
And to answer any questions, this shot was taken 18 months ago and we're still in a happy relationship travelling solo. Far better than when we were travelling together. Oh, and the motorcycle parts I took off Rachel's bike in Utah, I posted here to the end of the tat. And a design feature of the trike conversion was that it's only attached with seven bolts. So now that Rachel's back had had enough time to heal, I simply unbolted the trike parts and reverted her bike to its original state for Rachel to ride to Argentina. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes the story of Rachel and I travelling together. And I hope I did a good enough job of explaining it to you. This video series will continue, of course, but it will be solo stuff from now on. Cheers, and as always, thank you for watching. Hello everybody and welcome to the same Ecuadorian hotel room that I was in at the end of the last video. I've been here for a long time. Uh, this was a mammoth edit um, and I ended up making a 50 minute film. Uh, but I think it was worth it to tell the story properly to you guys. Um, I'll keep this brief because I've got to get to bed and then leave the city in the morning because my visa is about to expire. Uh, this video took just under four weeks to edit and uh, over $600 just in hotel and food costs alone. So if you are able to send me a PayPal donation, no matter how small, it really is appreciated. Um, some of you have asked me to set up a Patreon account so you can give monthly donations. I don't want to use Patreon because I actually lose 26% of all donations because of their stupid tax system. Um, it's just a really terrible way they do it. Um, there is a monthly donate button which I've just put on my website which you can do via PayPal. Um, you don't even need a PayPal account. You can just use a credit card or whatnot if you do wish to give uh, anything, no matter how small. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, if you if you are able to donate, then uh, no matter how little, uh, I just I can't say thank you enough. And I hope that my videos are a good start. But um, yeah, I've got to get to bed because it's one o'clock in the morning and I'm knackered and I've got to leave Ecuador. So thank you very much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video and I hope all of my time was worth it. So uh, yeah, cheers, guys.